It's my honor now to introduce our special guest. So our main presenter today is Rich Wilson. Rich is a democratic renewal expert with 18 years experience setting up and running new organizations, delivering and designing participative processes and policy development. In 2004, Rich was appointed as the first director of the charity Involve, which became a leading center for public participation research, innovation, and policy making. He has been an advisor for the OECD, the World Health Organization, and the UN Development Program. He's designed and facilitated well over 100 deliberative processes from small community workshops to large national and international processes involving thousands of citizens. He's the co-author of the UK's Empowerment White Paper and Deputy Chair of ScienceWise, the UK Government Engagement in Science and Technology Program. Rich regularly blogs for The Guardian and he's written many publications. He's currently working to set up two major new ventures, the Good Help Foundation and a Global Citizens Assembly, which has been called the biggest experiment in global democracy ever attempted. Something we're very excited to hear more about today. So thanks so much for joining us, Rich. I will give the floor to you. Thanks very much, Julian. And thanks very much for inviting me along here today. Um, yeah, well, let, let's let's see. I'll, I'll share with you the project. And I'll let you be the judge of um, whether it's the, going to be the biggest experiment we ever see or not, whether there's a long way to go. What I thought I'd do today, if that's OK, I'm going to kind of start with some big kind of ideas around democracy and where we are kind of right now. Um, then narrowing down to citizens assemblies, what are they about and what can they do? And then really thinking about these issues in terms of um, the citizens assembly that you want to run in terms of um, electoral reform. So hopefully that's kind of useful, um, but it obviously just take or leave whatever seems kind of appropriate and relevant to you. And just in case you're interested, I started off my career um, a long time ago now in 1997, I'm working for the IPCC, that was my first job, I was a kind of researcher there, and I was a parliamentary environmental lobbyist. And I got interested in democratic reform because when I was working in parliament, I just felt like that system was broken. Um, that opinion hasn't changed, I'm sad to say. Okay, um, so these are my, this goes through my email details here, in case you wanna get in touch, tweet or whatever. Um, don't know if anyone saw this article by um, Yuval Harari at this, um, around March last year when the when the lockdowns were really beginning to bite. But he wrote, he said that in this time of crisis, we could face two particularly important choices. The first is between totalitarian surveillance and citizen empowerment, and the second is between nationalist isolation and global solidarity. And really, how I would frame that, just move my screen a little bit so I can read everything, is that right now I think we face a choice of more or less democracy. Um, I think what we've really learned in the, you know, many of us are now living within the reality of the COVID climate and the climate crisis, we've learned that actually if we're going to be able to adapt to these situations, we are, we all need to take action, we need to socially isolate, we need to change our behaviour for um, environmental issues, etc. But actually, if we don't choose to do that by democratic means, authoritarian means will be found. And many of us right now are obviously, in my view, experiencing a form of that. You know, people say we're, you know, we're experiencing now the future. This is, I think this is it. We are now experiencing the, the way in which our democratic rights can be constrained by when, when it feels that our health depends on it. So in my view, we face a choice between more or less democracy. But I don't think things can stay the same. I think it's got to change. So we have the lowest opinion of democracy on record. Um, this is a well-established point. I'm sure many of you are aware of it. I won't go into the detail here, but everything I'm going to say in this report, in this presentation, is incredibly well evidenced. I can send you the evidence if you want it at a later stage. Um, obviously, we saw the, um, you know, the attacks um, and at the Capitol, um, but, but there's been research from the, in the FT just a few weeks ago talking about how millennials have got incredibly low um, trust of, um, in democracy, and it's everywhere. You will, I'll come on to in a moment the, the great challenge of democratic pushback we've experienced in 2020. 
But I just wanted to kind of remind ourselves of kind of the kind of foundations of, of kind of democracy and governance. Um, in John Stuart Mill's 1859 paper on liberty, he wrote, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. And really, it's this foundational point around safety. You know, is our system of government, whatever our system of government is, is it enabling to keep us safe for in, from pandemics, from climate? And it's clear at the moment that democracy doesn't seem to be able to answer that question quite as well as it once could. And the, our broken politics is clearly creating problems around a less safe world, polarization, the empathy gap, growing authoritarianism, powerlessness amongst citizens. Last year, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, 2020 saw the biggest ever democratic pushback we've seen, driven by the pandemic, literally billions of people at certain points didn't have democratic representation. So we are really living in unprecedented times, but it's not as simple as democracy or traditional representative democracy being in some ways you know, not fitting with the modern times. It's the fact that it's, it's literally been under attack. The Cambridge Analytica plot um, work is particularly kind of obvious around this, but there's the infodemic, fake news, weaponization of social media, surveillance and securitization, corporate power. There is a concerted uh, attack on our democracy that we're living through. So it's both the system you know, isn't managing to fit so well as perhaps it once would in terms of keeping us safe, but also it's under attack. And in my view, there's no kind of big easy answers ahead. I haven't got a kind of a, a magic bullet here. I've just got some thoughts and ideas which you know, we can use to kind of start a conversation. I do think we know though, to some extent, the transitions we need to make from kind of having bad policy, which doesn't enable us to kind of solve things like climate and inequality to good policy, better policy, powerlessness to citizen activation, building people's self-efficacy and our ability to feel we can change the world, polarization to empathy and solidarity, misinformation to truth, and then representation to participation. And again, this is, these are you know, in many ways, these, this, this idea of these transitions, are, there's a lot of consensus around them. I think we're living through the third great democratic struggle. And I'm not sure if we've got the words quite right around this, so kind of bear with me. Um, but just as we had the, you know, the battle for voting rights in the 1920s and across the world through the first half of the 20th century, in my opinion, we do not have universal suffrage. I agree with Dave, Professor David Runciman when he thinks we should consider extending voting rights to children. That's the, that's the thing that, so I think, you know, so that's a, it's just an illustration that that idea of voting rights is partial. You know, it's kind of progressing towards that. And I think the PR you know, agenda fits very much kind of within that. Civil rights in the 60s, clearly this is you know, an ongoing, unfolding um, struggle that we're part of. But also I think this right to participate in policymaking. I think Black Lives Matter, the Hong Kong um, movements, the climate movements are often saying we want to have a greater say in, in policymaking, be it around um, defunding the police or around having citizens assemblies on climate change. These are people saying we are demanding now that it's not just about kind of party politics or let, being through having democracy happening through our um, elected representatives, but we want to have to, democracy being more wider than that. And again, I think um, Runciman is very good on this. He says, and um, the Cambridge academic, he says that you know, in, in Western countries like Canada and the UK, we have um, democratic representation, but we don't really live in representative democracies. Democracies is really boxed into a very tiny part of our lives. And I think now we're part of this movement to try and really expand democracy into a much bigger part of our lives. I think citizens' assemblies provide some clues of how to get there. Um, and in terms of the work that I've done over the last kind of 20 years, it feels to me like we're sort of two thirds of the way through a 30 year plan to reboot democracy. It's probably much bigger than that, probably much longer um, plan than that. But in the, in the 2000s, experimenting with deliberative democracy, more recently kind of prototyping and refining citizens assemblies. And then in the 2020s, kind of scaling them to see if they can really kind of effectively work. So, so what are citizens' assemblies? What do they look like? Well, for those of you who don't know, what a citizens' assembly is, it's usually about 100 or 150 people 
selected by lottery that are as accurate a possible representation of the community in question. It could be a town, it could be a village, it could be a country, it could, in the work that I'm going to talk about later, be um, global. And so, for example, in the Global Citizens Assembly that I'm working on at the moment, we are ensuring that the, the people that participate will be a, a, as accurate a possible representation and reflection. And where they get their um, legitimacy from is really from two things, really. One is the fact that anyone could be selected through lottery. So, for example, we're having to come up with mechanisms to be able to do that globally. So the idea is that anyone in that particular geographic space could be selected. Um, and it should be, and the, and the way that's done is it, it's representative. There's a true and accurate representation of that community in practice. In, 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 in the field of deliberative democracy, there's all kinds of debates about how we can make that kind of more thorough. Because it's, it's, there's always imperfections for certain people don't want to turn up, certain people don't um, believe necessary in kind of you know, citizens assembly. So it's always imperfect. But I think what's really critical in any conversation around democratic reform is you know, the competition is the existing system. And the competition is monumentally imperfect. Okay, I mean, the, the lack of representation, et cetera, et cetera, the lack of agency, the way in which polarizing is generated is so, the, so let's, let, let's kind of make a comparator with what we have as opposed to an idealized perfection. So I've got some kind of examples here of the, um, the citizens assemblies that have been happening over the last more, most recent times. Um, citizens Assembly UK, the Scottish Assembly, the big one in France, the famous Irish Citizens Assembly. Um, but really this is part of a much bigger movement, originally talking about citizens juries, then citizens summits, America Speaks, really pioneering North American organization doing fabulous work in the kind of noughties, often forgotten now, um, but shouldn't be in, in my opinion, doing some of the most pioneering work that I've kind of ever seen. But it's, it's, it's been a real global movement in terms of deliberative democracy and happening all, all around the world. I can talk about that later, that's kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that's really happening now that it's new, is the way in which you know campaigners, notably, um, notably around kind of climate campaigners, but more generally, are coming behind citizen assemblies and saying, "Look, we need these to be able to get the ambitious policies required to get things done." And indeed, it is true that citizen assemblies are generating policies way more ambitious on many issues than, pol than politicians come come along with on their own. And so. What we're seeing is really clear evidence now of citizens' assemblies supporting these five transitions. They, 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 when they are run well, they can deliver incredibly ambitious policies. The policies coming out of the French citizens' assembly were remarkable support, getting eco side, um, um, retrofitting of all public buildings within 10 years, and an incredible suite of, um, of policies, which were also then supported by the vast majority of the French population activation. This doesn't always happen, but when a citizens assembly is run really well, and I think America Speaks really pioneered this work back in the noughties, the self-efficacy of the individuals who are part of it is really generated, um, and they feel they're able to affect change in their own lives and beyond. Again, this empathy point, when citizens assemblies are run well, they enable people who have got very, very different opinions to be able to come together and recognize the differences between them. And I think there's a really critical point around the empathy. Often there's an assumption that we're trying to build consensus. We're not trying to build consensus, not in my opinion anyway, not when, how I run citizens assemblies. I am trying to create the conditions to provide deep um, understanding between um, the individuals involved. And there's an amazing project of they call the Boston Conversations Project dealing with um, abortion in um, the 90s, whereby there was, um, whereby the, um, the, um, the anti-abortion campaign has actually murdered um, a number of people working for abortion centers. And what they did is the people within those, um, on both sides of that debate met um, in Boston, and they didn't meet to try and negotiate an agreement or a settlement or, or identify common ground. They just met to listen to each other. And through that process, mutual understanding emerged and even love was, was um, generated between them that completely transformed the abortion debate in that city from that point onwards. And when citizens' assemblies work well, that can happen for a country. It hasn't happened very often, but it can happen for a country. We have seen that happen. Um, truth, again, truth, not just in terms of the evidence, people talk a lot about evidence and science, but also people's lived experience. 
to be able to get, get a real feel for what's going to have the issues from a personal perspective. Often mistakes, I think, that can get made around citizens' assemblies are when people assume we want one outcome or another. When we do that, we don't necessarily allow the magic of the new possibilities to emerge. And of course, participation, that's kind of the key kind of goal we're trying to get to here. Um, in my view, we've proved the concept. The evidence now around citizens' assemblies I think is pretty cast iron. However, they are still often too small. Too few people are, are involved, too few people are aware of the assemblies. And actually, I think you can see there are numerous ones that have happened recently whereby they haven't captured the public imagination. However, that is changing. And the French um, Convention for the Climat is a really good example of this. 70% of the French people at the time knew about it. We think it's much more like 95% now. I mean, the, the debate that's happening now, even six months after the closure of that convention around its outcome is profound. It's been like a defibrillator on French democracy. It's, it's, it's an incredible thing that's happening there. We've 62% of the um, French population um, have been supporting the vast majority of the, of the recommendations. It is transforming. Um, both the conversation about democracy in France, but also the conversation about, about climate. Um, yeah, I won't talk about Macron now, but he, um, he well, what's interesting around Macron, Macron, what he did is he said he would, he, for the first time, he said he would he, not implement, but he said he would you know, consider the recommendations without a filter. They would either be all uh, implemented through executive order or through recommendation, or there was another method, I forgot what it is. But the fact that he gave it that weight of legitimacy did, did you know, create the conditions for that kind of defibrillating effect that we've, we've seen there in France. Um, um, I wrote a piece um, for Carnegie Europe comparing the UK and the, and the French Assembly um, in November this year. You, you, we can send the link around if that's kind of helpful. Um, I just wanted to go into some of the detail now, I thought you might find it kind of helpful. We think there are some kind of design principles for how you might want to think about doing your citizens assembly um, on electoral reform in Canada. Um, so I think that it needs to be a robust and independent process. It needs to be transparent, both in terms of the governance, the process design, expert selection. Um, we've seen some real issues around the, the failure of transparency of expert selection, the Scottish Climate Assembly at the moment. Um, locating the assembly in citizens' hopes and fears do not start with that kind of predetermined outcome. And then this issue of taking citizens on a profound learning journey. And again, the, the Scottish Citizens Assembly taking place at the moment. It's been, an, it's been a really, really good example of doing that, really engaging people with the futures that are available and really supporting people to engage in the, in the emotional challenges going on, maximizing the legitimacy where possible. You know, sometimes I think 150 people is not enough to ensure true representation. If we give these, the more powerful these interventions become, the more we have to defend them in the wider political arena. So legitimacy really, really matters. And then this generating a wider conversation. And the reason that both the, the Irish and the French citizens assemblies had such a powerful impact on policy was because they generated this wider national conversation. I'm increasingly convinced that it's a, it's a prerequisite now. If, you, if you're wanting to really have a big effect on the wider policy. And it's fostering emotionally intelligent participation. And I'm going to jump to that right now. This, I think, is critical to really understand, if you like, good and bad citizens' assemblies. Good citizens' assemblies perform what I call type three um, dialogue and emotionally intelligent engagement, whereby people will engage from the point of their hopes and their fears. They will look at a crisis such as COVID or climate, or the, if you look at the reality of electoral reform, because we've heard you know, many of the people in this space are interested in, from an environmental perspective. Let's get to the profound human hopes and fears within that. And then when we get to that place, we're not going into a fight or flight, incredible connection can happen and new possibilities could emerge. However, very often citizens assemblies are run at the opinion level. It's, it's just like punch and duty politics like you see in parliament. And if it's happening at that level, your citizens assembly is I, I would say probably not working properly and probably not going to deliver the kind of outcomes you're looking for. So I think you've, we all face some choices when we're running a citizens assembly. Do we want it to be around policy development or just appraisal of pre-existing policies? Do we want it to be about transformative change or incremental change? Do we want it to be a national conversation or, or a private discussion? A political chamber, as we saw in France, or informing a political chamber? chamber as we saw in the UK. I'm sitting about activating citizens, supporting citizens to take forward the recommendations or not. 
seeing citizens as political actors, giving them profile on television and the media, or simply as an intelligence resource to inform the political chamber. Citizens shaping and owning the process or, or not, or being more of a kind of a part of an institutional framework like we see with the Danish Board of Technology. Um, citizens involved in selecting experts or not. And these are choices. There is no right or wrong here, but the choices you make need to be explicit because it will profoundly affect the results of the citizens' assembly you undertake. So I'm not quite sure how I'm doing for time, um, but I'll just quickly jump into the global assembly that I'm involved with helping run at the moment, just to give you a taste of how we're mapping this intelligence on to this process at the moment. So we're supported by the UN and the UNFCCC, the COP26 champions, and we're working very closely with the UK and the Scottish government. So, you know, gr enormous gratitude to all those organisations for supporting and backing this project. We launched on the 10th of December. Um, it's a new Reuters article from that point. And really, but the one thing I wanted to get to here was the kind of the method. So we've got this kind of five elements and components of our method. At the heart of it is the citizens um, that I mentioned before, but also we've been working with civil society actors over the last year to kind of co-create the project, working closely with the institutions that I mentioned before, um, but also cultural influencers. I'll talk about that in a second. I think that that's been absolutely critical to this process um, and the wider media to create this, you know, this you know, global conversation, in this case, about the climate emergency. Um, we're looking at doing having a core assembly. We were originally hoping to have a thousand people, but we're, frankly, we're running out of time. So we're um, going to be having 300 people now with distributed events. But what we're looking at doing for the global assembly is creating a permanent piece of international infrastructure. So we're seeing this year as a prototyping and testing year, when and the, and the, the following year um, in 2022 was like scaling it up to a thousand people in the core assembly. Um, what's the, the a unique aspect of our model is these distributed events. So anyone will be able to run a, um, a, a meeting anywhere. So this could be I mean, in a school, in the community group, and we're using the app, they will be able to follow the same conversation that's being held by the 300 people in the core, engaging with the scenarios, the real experience, but actually you know, mapping onto their own lived experience themselves. Um, it's gonna be digital by default. We've learned over the last year, all the citizens assemblies have gone um, digital using, to be honest with you, frankly, they're not that different from this the event we're experiencing now, but breaking down often into much smaller events. Um, smaller components about having kind of deep, profound kind of conversations between people. Um, this is the five phase plan we developed. So the first phase is a very, really helps supporting people to engage in the reality of the situation. What people often ask, they often say, so what's your question your citizens assembly is going to um, identify? And we're not going to determine that until phase two, because this is a bottom up assembly. This has been co-created with institutions, but also with citizens, which makes it quite unusual. And so we think you get insufficiently transformative questions if you have it um, and determined top down. So we're going to be having the initial um, part of the assembly, whereby everyone engages in the reality of the situation. And from that, say, OK, what do you want to talk about for the following four stages? And that and the citizens themselves will determine that question. We'll look at the kind of future priorities for life in 2040, creating the future, and then building towards a set of kind of actions and priorities and recommendations to be um, tabled as part of the plenary discussions at COP26. Um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the cultural wave. It's a really important part of our process because for us, what's important is that not to rely upon the traditional media, but to work with influencers to be able to really get larger numbers of people engaged with the discussions taking place. And again, you can see some of the Nollywood, Bollywood actors, various kind of famous um, artists we've spoken to so far to get involved in the process. We're very much hoping that we have a um, documentary following the process to kind, of, to kind of bring the discussion out to larger and wider numbers of people. Um, these, are, these are my colleagues involved with the process. Again, I can share the slides with you another time if you want to see. It's all on our website, globalassembly.org, if that's interesting and useful. This, I think, has been critical for us. We, I got approached to run this in December 2019. Um, and at that point in time, we were planning to run it in the November of 2020 because it hadn't been delayed by COVID. And I frankly didn't think there was time to do it justice because... I'd learned from experience that unless you do it bottom up, co-designing it with the citizens, it doesn't get that kind of wider conversation and buy-in and transformative potential that I think I would really want from this kind of assembly. 
and it's worth saying I was involved with running um, similar processes, both for the um, Paris and the Copenhagen COP. So we'd learned from that experience. Um, so we spent a lot of time last year talking to grassroots movements around what they wanted the assembly to do. And indeed the branding for it, which is this beautiful symbol, Akoma and Natosa, which symbolizes um, deep understanding and agreement and harmony possible between people when you communicate from the heart. So we're really trying to model a new kind of democracy as part of how we do this process and building it bottom up. So yeah, these are the key choices. I mentioned them already. I really feel like for the electoral reform citizens assembly in Canada, these feel absolutely critical to make these really conscious. Um, this is me. Um, thanks very much for listening. I hope, I hope that was useful. That was great. Thank you so much, Richard. I think the observation that, that things are going to change and that we're at kind of a fork in the road is, is very insightful. And the message that our democracy is under attack resonates particularly in light of recent events. So um, thank you for your part in doing the hard work of teaching us how we might come out the other side stronger by expanding and even transforming our democracy. So a reminder for everyone listening, if you have a question you'd like answered by one of our panelists, please type it into the Q&A box. We'll try to get to as many as we can after the panelists speak. But if you do see a question there that you would like to see answered or if it's similar to the one that you're thinking of, please feel free to upvote it by clicking on the thumbs up icon under the question rather than, answer, rather than entering a, another question that's very similar. Um, so our next panelist is Kleina Jordan. Kleina is a lifelong meliorist and is the co-chief executive of Make Votes Matter, our UK counterpart. So to save you all from running to the dictionary, which I had to do, <laughs> a meliorist is someone who subscribes to the belief that the world can be made better by human effort. So she has diverse experience from a 20 plus career, including events, marketing, business development, management, and sustainable enterprise. Kleina also leads the PR Alliance, which includes seven parliamentary parties, many organizations, and public figures. She's also the chairperson, primary speaker, and oversees much of the campaign, working to weave it into a coherent whole. Her passion is devising creative actions for equal votes, and she loves dancing. Kleina focuses on electoral reform because she knows that without equal votes, we can't take effective action on urgent environmental and social issues. She believes that we can win real democracy soon if we collaborate. So she encourages people to take hope and action. Well, Kleina, you've got five minutes, and then I'll be reminding you to wrap it up. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Gisela. Um, and thanks, Rachel, so for that great presentation. That's um, yeah, very informative. So I'm looking forward to <laughs> reading it through again afterwards as well. Um, and my heart is hammering in my chest. I've, I've not been very well and it feels like a very big event with very important speakers. So um, do forgive me if I <laughs> bumble my words a bit from now, from time to time. Um, and I want to start off with a fantastic quote by Elizabeth May, which I've had stuck on a sticky note on the side of my screen for a few years, I think. <laughs> um, and it really sums up a lot about how I feel about democracy. So here it is. I draw a clear line between democracy and politics. I find politics a dismal and soul destroying experience, but I love democracy, which is which at its best is ennobling and inspiring. And I think that's really at the heart of kind of why I'm here and I'm doing this because I was always repulsed by politics and I thought that was democracy. And I think a lot of people do think that that is democracy. And of course it's not, it's, uh, it's somewhere on the way to democracy in terms of the UK and Canada. And this brings me on to an apology, which I have no mandate whatsoever to make, but I'm going to make it anyway, because the first past the post voting system that we use in these two countries is a really horrible colonial export from Britain. And so I apologize to all of you in Canada who are having to deal with this because it's pretty awful. And um, you guys have quite a, a close mirroring of uh, our political system here, which is very binary and oppositional. And it's like two groups of blokes shouting at each other a lot of the time. And it's less so now and gradually becomes less so, but we know that with proportional representation, it would become even less so 
it would be more about the kind of things that Richard was talking about with the um, citizens actually participating and having agency and, and being able to influence what's happening in the country. Um, and for me, proportional representation is very much the necessary keystone that enables us to put the other building blocks of democracy into place. Um, and that's not to say things should happen one at a time. I'm not saying PR has to come first and obviously it isn't coming first, but uh, without PR, it's very difficult to put the other things in, in place, like reforming the House of Lords, which I'm sure Natalie will be telling you a little bit about shortly. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, not, not having people really empowered to, to have real say. In fact, um, I, I won't go too much into PR because I'm sure most people listening are already aware about the problems with PR, but we know that um, first past the post can result in wrong winner elections. It did in the 50s and the 70s in the UK, once with the Tories getting more votes and Labour winning power and one time the other way round. It happened with Donald Trump winning when actually Hillary Clinton had won the popular vote in the states. Um, so that really is not democracy as far as I'm concerned. It's that those examples are the opposite of democracy, the people getting the opposite of what they voted for. Um, and we know that there is a huge um, bias created by uh, first past the post and other majoritarian systems. Um, so uh, in, in the UK, the example is in 19 out of 20 of the last elections, um, the majority of people have voted for parties to the left of the Tories. So that's kind of centre and across to the left. But the Tories have been, the Conservatives have been in power for the vast majority of that time. And this isn't a campaign about saying, well, that politics should be more left wing. It's about saying the parliament should represent us. So if the party gets 20% of the vote, they get 20% of the seats. And it's as simple as that. So the Conservatives should have their representation. The Greens should have their representation. Labour should have their representation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and that's, that's really important because without that, we're not bringing in all of the wisdom of the people in the country who, with, with their individual wisdom, when we hear all of that, we, we come up with better outcomes, the better policy, policy decisions that Rich was talking about. Um, so I'll say a little bit about Make Votes Matter um, and uh, why we're interested in citizens' assemblies. Um, we're the national campaign spearheading the movement for PR in the UK. There are many other organisations and like most of the parties who are all on board as well about the need for proportional representation or equal votes is an easier way to say it. Um, and uh, we believe that the best chance we have of bringing that in is um, by electing a majority of pro PR MPs. Um, because the other option is basically uh, uh, some kind of revolution and we're not so good at those in the UK. Um, we need to learn something from the French maybe. <laughs> um, and so we have three kind of parts to our strategy of how we get there. And the first bit is the grassroots and um, we need a national movement all over the country of people taking action and calling on their representatives even if they're not the ones that they chose um, to demand proportional representation. And so that's constantly growing. And we have local groups all over the country taking action, as I know you guys do in Canada as well. Um, and we do national action days where people drop banners from bridges um, and have done all sorts of creative things. And we hold lobby events and our, our next one is gonna be our first virtual one. Um, so that's going to be quite exciting. I, I'm hopeful it's going to mean that a lot more people are able to participate. So that's going to be on the 12th of March, as easy as one, two, three. Um, so hopefully anyone who's listening who isn't yet signed up to that will, will do so on our, on our website, makevotesmatter.org.uk. So that's a, a short summary about the grassroots. The next of the three strands is Labour, and we believe we need one of the two big parties on board to make this change. So there's a huge amount of energy going into that, and um, we, we believe that it's possible we might be able to bring them on board this year at their um, September conference. Um, and we're working with a whole load of other organisations in a coalition called Labour for a New Democracy in order to bring that about. And one of the key parts of that is the grassroots work. It's um, getting um, motions raised at constituency Labour parties, which are the kind of the local building blocks of the Labour Party. 
and there are now 156 CLPs who have raised those motions. Um, so we're, we're getting quite excited that we're, we're going to have a very large number before the time of the September um, conference. Um, we're also obviously talking to the unions, which are a key player in <laughs> what Labour decide to do. Um, and there's all sorts of other aspects of that that are going on. So again, if you're a Labour Party member, do get involved with that. Um, then the final of the three strands is the alliance. And the alliance includes all of the British opposition parties aside from Labour, but lots of Labour MPs and some really senior ones as well. Um, and so we will work together basically to coordinate our action and so we can have the biggest impact possible to um, bring in PR. Um, and Natalie is one of our long-standing <laughs> best serving members. So thanks to Natalie for that. And, and Richard and Oscar are also actually in that alliance. So thanks for your support over the years. Um, and the key thing about the alliance is I think our greatest achievement to date was uh, last summer, not this one just gone, the one before 2019, um, we released the Good Systems Agreement. And that was an unprecedented national agreement about what good voting systems look like and how to get there. And so it was a condensation of lots of national uh, consultations, commissions, et cetera, about voting systems and pick, pulling out the, the kind of the heart of each of those to have the key bits. And so we've actually got just 10 principles like proportionality, having local representation. Um, if there are lists used, they need to be democratically chosen. I won't go through the whole list. Um, but the really important part about the Good Systems Agreement is that it should not be the politicians who get to choose the voting system. And it shouldn't be even us in the democracy sector who get to choose the voting system. We could all argue till we're blue in the face about what our favorite voting system is. But the reality is that different values result in different voting system preferences. And so you're, there's never gonna be one perfect one and for the UK, we believe that there needs to be a national representative conversation, a citizen led, deliberative, fully informed process, which of, of which a citizens assembly would be a perfect example. Um, and we had some slight trouble getting the agreement, the wording agreed uh, about using the word citizens assembly at the time. We were trying to push I, I the encourage you to, to wrap up if you could, please. Yeah. We're, we're a little over time. So if, if yeah. you just want to get, take another second to wrap up, go ahead. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, we didn't quite get the word citizens assembly in there, but that's basically what it means that we, we want a deliberative process. And that's not about saying this is about proportional representation. It's about saying how do we want to choose our representative, representatives in the UK? And um, so when we get to that stage, we very much welcome expert advice from the likes of Rich and, and, and others about how we do that. But we want to get Labour on board first because we want them to be part of that process. So we're a little behind Canada and we're not yet advocating that we want to do this now, but it's very clearly the next step for us after we get the Labour Party on board. Um, so I'm sorry, taking a little bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> you were a little bit behind Canada. I, I think we might want to talk a little bit more about that because I'm not sure we, we all perceive that in quite the same way. But um, thank you. Yeah, sadly, your description of two groups of blokes shouting at each other still sums things up pretty well quite frequently. Um, but I, I really like the framing of what you said when it's, it's not a plot by one part of the spectrum or another, but rather about winning representation for all parts of the spectrum. Thank you very much for those insights. Our next panelist is Elizabeth May. Elizabeth will need no introduction for our Canadian participants. She has been a member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands since 2011 and served as a leader of the Green Party of Canada from 2006 to 2019, which makes her the longest serving female leader of a Canadian federal party. Elizabeth first became known in the Canadian media in the mid 1970s. Geez, well, let's just save time. Ick. <laughs> She's been voted numerous times by fellow MPs as parliamentarian of the year, hardest working MP, and best orator. So thanks so much for joining us from today, Elizabeth. Go ahead. Thanks, Gisela. I was trying to say, okay, no introductions. Let's just move ahead. I'll do my territorial acknowledgement. I'm here in the traditional territory of Wasanich people. 
Heishka, Heishka Sam. Uh, welcome and thank you all, an honor to all of you. It's really cool to be with you. And, and Kleina, I'm totally blown away that you would have a quote from me on your fridge. Like, how did that happen? But I'm, I'm watching the clock very carefully. I want to step back and I, first of all, Rich, fantastic. I have to say, I felt a fool that my limited imagination, citizens' assemblies in all Green Party of Canada policies have related to how we get to electoral reform. And very cool to realize we can also use that to get to climate action. Very interesting observations. But what I wanted to, to focus on was that uh, in this time of COVID, we've gotten media to look at something, which is interesting. They say, oh, look at the countries that are doing well. And what they observe is that they have women leaders. What they haven't observed is that they have a, a voting system that's proportional and fair. So how does that happen? And how do we take that to a larger level of understanding of how voting systems affect our awareness? Uh, so, and, and our policies. So for that, I wanted to make sure everybody who cares about fair voting, and I'm sure everybody does know the name Arndt Liebhardt and the book Patterns of Democracy. But Patterns of Democracy, and if you don't know it, get it and read it, looking at 36 different democracies from around the world and splitting them up between the winner-take-all voting system of first-past-the-post or preferential voting, any of those first pa uh, the, those winner-take-all systems, in contrast to what he defines as consensus voting systems, which would be obviously single transferable vote, mixed member proportional, or any of their variants. A consensus voting system leads to better policy, better economic policy, better environmental policy, better COVID policy, more consensus, more reason, less just partisanship for the sake of partisanship. And the longer I've been in politics, and as, as Gisela was saying, I've been leader of the Green Party since 2006. But before that, I was not in any political party. I was the executive director of a national environmental group. I worked a lot on trying to get to, you know, to policy changes that would make a difference. And I never liked first past the post. But going into politics in the scumminess of it, I realized what makes it so nasty in first past the post countries is the reality that in a first past the post country, uh, people are, uh, one party is going to be very, very vicious to whatever party they think is closest to them ideologically. That's why Labour ran a hard campaign against Carolyn Lucas and, and Molly and uh, Scott Cato in, in Bristol when, when the British Greens in 2017 had pulled back to make sure Theresa May and the Conservatives get, didn't get a majority. That effort at cooperation and, and generous self-sacrifice was rewarded by Jeremy Corbyn in Labour in exactly the same way that Jagmeet Singh and the New Democrats in Canada went after me with a vicious campaign of lies after we stepped back to ensure that he could win in a by-election. It's not what's wrong with those individual men. It's what's wrong with a system that makes political strategy hinge on killing the other guy, particularly if the other guy might appeal to your voter base. So it's absolutely contrary to anything that could involve good policy making. So in the context of climate change, in the context of COVID, where you have a, a voter base that, that where the incentive of political leadership is to find segmentation, wedge issues, ways to manipulate on a riding by riding or in our country now electoral district by electoral district, a strategy to form a false majority. Because in the Westminster parliamentary system, a majority government is 100% of the power, unlike in some other first-past-the-post systems, like in the United States, uh, as a result of their election, I mean, rather, not of their election, as a result of their revolution, their constitution is differently structured, and no one part of that system has all the power. So as much as um, Donald Trump had too much power, we can all agree, but as, an, as the executive branch, it didn't control the legislative. In any of our Westminster parliamentary democracies, Democracies, a false majority leads to 100% of the power, which is why they're so terribly dangerous. I try to describe to people why we need to get rid of first past the post in terms of how do we inoculate 
our democracy, back to what Rich was saying, the populist threat to democracies, the increasing risk of fascism. How do we inoculate our democracies against that? We have to adopt fair voting while we can. Otherwise, we can't, we can't be sure that any one of our countries is immune from either in Canada or in the UK, uh, a, you know, a populist leader of the likes of Trump. One of the fascinating things about climate policy, though, and I full credit to our UK colleagues, somehow the progressive elements within the Westminster Parliament got a Climate Accountability Act passed in 2008, which has preserved steady moves forward, even by Boris Johnson, in steadily reducing carbon, whereas in Canada, we have increased carbon emissions ever since we agreed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 to stop increasing greenhouse gases. They have increased since 1990 by over by 21%, while in the UK they've dropped below 1990 levels to at this point, I think 40% with a commitment, 44% with a commitment to, to 69% reductions below 1990 by 2030, a stunning commitment, uh, which speaks to, I think, the climate movement in the UK, but the strength of the Climate Accountability Act. So I know my time's up, Gisela. I just would say the Canadians listening and watching the fake Climate Accountability Act introduced by the Liberals this uh, at the very tail end of 2020, make no mistake, it does not do what the Climate Accountability Act did in the UK. So maybe we can organize some citizens' assemblies around that in Canada while there's still time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. We really appreciate your years of hard work and advocacy on the cause. So thank you for, for keeping on going. Um, our final speaker now, I just wanna move quickly into the last one before we have our Q&A. Uh, reminder that you can put questions into the Q&A at the bottom and upvote the ones that you think are, are you most want to hear the answers to. So our final speaker, is Natalie Bennett. Natalie has spent a year as a member of the House of Lords in the UK, having been member, having been leader of the Green Party of England and Wales for from 2012 to 2016. And uh, most of her professional career was spent as a journalist, including on the Bangkok Post and as editor of the Guardian Weekly. We're very honored to have you join us today, Natalie. So you've also got five minutes and then I'll be encouraging you to wrap up. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Lisa. And lovely to see so many people on this call and really great to hear what everyone said thus far. And I really enjoyed Rich's presentation. Um, I'm going to make a territorial acknowledgement that will also help explain my accent, which is that I grew up in the lands of what were the of the uh, Wallamedagadagal people, which is in the um, outskirts of what's now Sydney, uh, Australia. Uh, so that explains my accent as well as my background. Um, and it was great to see, just seeing through the chat box that we have people from the UK here. The range I saw was from Totnes to Hebden Bridge. So that's a pretty good range. So I'm glad to see that range across the UK. Um, and I was gonna start with a reference to, to an event in Sheffield. The University of Sheffield hosted a uh, American academic called Jason Brennan, uh, who's written a book called Against Democracy. And his basic thesis was that, well, democracy has failed. And I was thinking of this as Rich was talking about all of those people saying that, you know, they don't really believe in democracy anymore. And uh, this was an academic presentation and he made the presentation and I was asked to make the sort of formal response to this. And I'm afraid um, I probably wasn't, I was bringing out some of my Australian bluntness, something I'm often accused of, uh, because basically I said all of his evidence, pretty well all of his data was based on the US and some UK examples. And I said, before we give up on democracy, maybe we should try actually having some democracy first. Uh, and um, yes, well, we, they sat him beside me at dinner and, we, and he didn't speak to me for the whole evening. So I think that tells you how the evening went. But I spent several years as Green Party leader going around the country saying, oh, you know, we've really got to reform our democracy. We've really got to fix things up. Uh, and then eventually one day I thought, well, actually the UK is not a democracy. And the first time I, I said that, um, I said it to a room of, you know, a fairly mixed public meeting kind of room, and I was expecting a great deal of kickback. And looked around the room, and everyone kind of looked at each other and kind of went, yeah, you're right. Uh, and I've been saying it ever since. Um, and I've had 
almost no kickback ever on it. Because if you look at the fact that we have a current government, uh, the Tory Conservative Party got 44% of the vote in 2019. And in the lower house, the House of Commons, they have 100% of the power. They've got a majority of 80. Of 80. Um, one of the very strange things about British politics, which is becoming more and more evident, is the House of Lords, this weird appointed house um, with its weird hereditary element, you know, a mixture of 17th and 18th century models, is actually more representative of the country than the elected House of Commons, because in the House of Lords, our crossbenchers, our non-party people, who are often like former judges, former ballet dancers, former NGO chiefs, um, they actually have the balance of power. And increasingly what we're seeing is you know, every bill, five or six things, we're standing up to the government saying, this is terrible, you can't do that. And that's representing the country. It's a very strange situation to be in. But I do want to focus on some positives because I'm always looking towards hope. And there, in terms of citizens assemblies and the whole model, there's some real developments. We had, of course, the climate assembly that unfortunately got hit by COVID, but produced some really strong results um, in sort of March, April last year. Going back a couple of years before that, the Electoral Reform Society actually ran a couple of trials. Um, they got a little bit of money. There wasn't quite enough money. It all had to happen in a bit of a hurry in the way these things often do. But they actually did in Sheffield and Southampton, two trials of citizens assembly looking at electoral reform and constitutional reform of local government. Um, and I actually went to the wrap up meeting of that. And it was fascinating because one of the people I remember was a, a lovely man from Southampton um, who was a retired news agent. He just retired. And so he saw the ad for this thing and he came along and he'd never been interested in politics before. And, you know, he was never going to vote for the Green Party. But he and I sat and had a lovely chat and it was wonderful to see this, you know, just interested citizen who got really involved in how our democracy worked or didn't work, really engaged a real advertisement for the process. And something else that's happened in the UK, uh, which I heard about at the all party parliamentary group on deliberative democracy, which is a group in the UK that's doing a lot of good work around these areas, um, was the government, actually the 2017 Conservative government, which was somewhat less ukip rather less far right than our current Conservative government, but still it was a Conservative government did actually run a series of trials of citizens assemblies looking at local issues, like, for example, a whole regional area, how are we going to deal with our traffic and air pollution problem? Um, and the interesting thing was that those were seen to have gone very, very well. And Baroness Barron, a conservative um, minister, um, comes from the kind of, she used to be in local government, the, the more uh, let me be tactful, red, sensible wing of the conservative party, but nonetheless, she's now a convert to the whole idea of citizens assemblies. So I think it's really crucial, and it's been Green Party policy in England and Wales for a long time to say how we get electoral reform is through a citizens assembly, partly because we had a referendum on the alternative vote, which is of course not a proportional system in 2011. Um, and that got hopelessly bogged down in debates about the detail of the system. And the citizens assembly is the way you get away from that. You say, right, we want PR, then we can talk about the details of exactly what the structure looks like. It overcomes the problem of how you get the turkeys. Um, I'm not being rude about the House of Commons, really, how you get the turkeys to vote for Christmas. Uh, but I would say that the citizen assembly is crucial, but we also need to just build public knowledge and public understanding. Because as Klein has said, you know, make votes matter is rightly pushing on getting this to become Labour Party policy. Um, but it has been Labour Party policy before, certainly to at least have a, a PR elected House of Lords, uh, and they got into government and just threw it out. And so we have to, even if we elect, elect a PR majority parliament, we have to make sure there is the public support, the public knowledge, the public understanding that's going to force those turkeys who've been elected under a first past the post system to vote for Christmas. Um, and I apologise if that's a slightly um, ungreen reference, but everyone knows what I mean. But there's one final thing I want to say about citizens assemblies, and this is my final final point. We do have to think about the fact that if we're going to ask people to do the democracy, that takes time and energy. In our societies with extremely long working hours, great financial insecurity, we've got to think about how do we ask people to do this work? And which is why I think things like Green Party policies in England and Wales, a four day working week is standard with no loss of pay. I heard a great group down in Brighton and Hove where Caroline Lucas is, is MP, um, the Brighton and Hove food group. 
um, who are saying that every time they do a consultation with their users, who are basically people with drug and alcohol problems, people with mental health issues, they try and make sure all the people engaged in that are paid in some way, rewarded in some way. Because you know, we often run events, do things where paid people are paid lots of money, the professionals are there, and the public is consulted and they're expected to devote all their time and energy for nothing. And I think that's something we've really got to think about in the longer term, because lots of people don't have that time and energy now, and we need to create a society a participatory democracy society has to be one where people have time and energy to get involved. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much in all of those presentations. I just, I want to ask all the questions. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to do now, though, is um, encourage people again to check what's in the Q&A box. If there's something there that you'd like to see answered, please upvote it. But while that's happening, I'm just going to pick up on one of the things that Natalie just spoke about and encourage uh, whoever of the panelists who would like to answer it to chime in. The, uh, the intent here is to hear from all of you, but maybe not all of you on every question, just to keep us going through the questions. So um, the first question that I, I want to ask, and this is mine, I'm, I'm cheating, I'm pulling the uh, host privilege here. Um, Natalie, you mentioned that the, uh, the Citizens Assembly that you would like to see in the UK should be PR, um, give them PR and then tell them where they want to and let them decide where they want to go with it. Does it have to be PR only or should it say we need to let citizens decide whether and how to reform the electoral system? Do you want to stipulate PR? Um, so I'm going to give the first uh, word here to Rich on that question, please. So I mean, I've been involved with these conversations for about 20 years about these things. And I have, so I have a view on this, which may be different from Kalina's and Natalie's and the rest of yours. But and this, is, this is what I said to Graham Allen, you know, when, when we were talking about the, um, the, the UK Citizens Assembly on Constitutional Reform. Unfortunately, we love, you know, we are very, very interested in constitutional issues in, by, by definition on this call, but hardly anyone is. And we just have to accept that. We just, I don't know what it's like in Canada, I don't know. But in the UK, no one is, not one, well, not really. They're just not, sadly. And yet it's profoundly important. And I agree with what everyone said. And so my experience of doing quite a lot of deliberation on the subject over the years is that if you can connect it to people's hopes and fears in their lives. So, so when thinking about these questions, you, you know, um, there's this American academic called Furino who talk, talk about participation having three objectives. Kind of instrumentalists, kind of substantive and normative. Instrumentalist means you want to get an outcome. It sounds like you guys want an outcome type of PR. Normative is basically you're just doing it because you think it's the right way of doing and politics. Um, substantive is because you think in and of itself, it generates good things like agency, for example. And I and my experience is, is that when we're being instrumentalist, you know, which is perfectly legitimate, perfectly legitimate, we are in danger of actually not in that getting the kind of groundswell and outcome and, and transformative process that we, we want. Because and let's face it, democracy is, 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 is creaking in many ways, in many ways. So, and, and, and the voting system is part of that, it really is. And I, I completely support the electoral reform. But if you look at lots of the countries who've got amazing proportional representation, they're not necessarily doing brilliant on climate. The correlation between proportional representation and to climate, which is my core issue, is not, you know, is not as good as I'd like it to be. So we just have to acknowledge that. We have to accept, and I think that what's, these processes are most powerful when you allow citizens themselves to, to understand the real context we're dealing with, really connect with the profound human tragedies that are often underpinning these issues, and then design their own proposal from there. And if we start with any proposition for a citizens' assembly where they're very narrow, definition, then in my experience, you very get you usually get a very narrow kind of um, debate which comes from it and becomes much less useful. Your ability to create a wider public mass debate and an education debate on on the need for democratic reform will probably be lost. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add to what Richard has said? Go ahead, Natalie. I just want to clarify a little what I was saying was in terms of I'm not necessarily saying that the um, Citizens Assembly should, shouldn't be left with an open um, phrase. What I think is we should campaign uh, for PR and say leave it to the Citizens Assembly to decide 
what that PR looks like. But I do want to suggest you just want to slightly disagree with Rich about um, interest in constitutional issues. I agree if you went and asked a question and said are people in the UK interested in that, uh, they would probably go look at you rather blankly. But if you look at what won the 2016 Brexit referendum, the slogan was take back control. And that was about people not feeling in control of their own lives, their own communities. And that's utterly constitutional, even if people mightn't put it in those terms. And in terms of what you said about climate, I mean, what I would say about climate and about many other crucial issues that uh, proportional representation is a necessary condition for any kind of functional democracy, um, including a democracy dealing with the climate emergency, but it's not a sufficient condition on its own, you need other elements of society as well. You know, just like anything, anyone who says to you, there's this one thing and it's going to solve all of our problems, I will immediately be terribly suspicious of them. Okay. And, you know, I don't think either at PR or a Citizens Assembly will solve all of our problems. We need much more, much larger, broader change. Thank you. Kleiner. Thank you. Um, yeah, largely ag agreeing, but just wanted to add a, a couple of things. Um, so we're absolutely not advocating on the Citizens Assembly to get PR, it's to have that conversation about what the voting system should look like. Um, and I think y y whilst I would like also like to see more correlation between PR and uh, better environmental outcomes, there is actually a huge correlation between um, proportional representation and better environmental outcomes like countries ratified the Kyoto Protocol quicker, they take faster action on climate change, uh, climate crisis, um, they have much more renewable energy. And I think one of the reasons for me, and this isn't kind of evidence-based, but I believe that the UK, Canada, the USA, these kind of leading big countries, well, not necessarily in size, but in influence in the world, they play this huge role in, in the global sphere. And I think that drags everybody back because we have these out these political out outcomes which are always skewed to the right and there isn't enough attention put to the really urgent issues of the day. And we know that first past the post enables lobbying massively because not only you're not just talking to two parties, you're really talking to one party to get what you want done. And if you're talking about big oil and gas, it's much easier for them to, to have their way. So I just wanna flag that up. And I think if we took that blockage out of like our countries like if we could lead the way I think that unblocks a lot of the system about the environmental action that urgently needs to happen and that's entirely why I am here <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite passionate about this I think it really could help and um, make make things more comfortable thank you right then I will move into the first of our participants questions how do you avoid mob rule with citizen assemblies for example, imagine all of Trump's followers having a citizen's assembly. Who would like to answer that one? Elizabeth? Please. I'd like to jump in. I saw, I saw that question. It's a, it's a really good one. And I think it was from Jeff Strong, who's a climate scientist. I think you have to frame your discussion in the kind of ethic uh, that Rich set out in the beginning. And it, this consensus decision making is it happens to be part of green values in our constitution, in the Green Party of Canada, we work to consensus, which means respectful listening. So if you don't, if you and I think Canada, and really, if you go back to John Ralston Saul's book, uh, A Fairer Country, he talks about how Canada, we sort of absorb by osmosis, some in, you know indigenous values, particularly around the Iroquois Confederacy, this consensus notion is much more commonly felt as a, as a good way of, of talking to each other in Canada than in the US. I mean, we're losing some of the civility in our public discourse because of contamination from US politics, but we've still got it here. And I think if you, if you if, particularly if you construct as the British Columbia Citizens Assembly that looked at electoral reform um, uh, more than a decade ago now, I guess 15 years ago. So, but it was, I've talked to people who were part of that assembly and they felt one of the things that helped enormously was the room that was chosen had seat seating in the round there were no there was no oppositional seating so this sit sitting in a big circle with hundreds of people led to a consensus and i think if the, if the conversation is properly structured if the rules of engagement are clear mob rule isn't a risk Thank you. Rich, please go ahead. Yeah, just to say, I mean, I mean, I've been involved with an awful lot of these processes and I've never experienced this mob rule issue. But just what's critical is the selection. 
So of course it has to be representative of the place in question. So by definition, it shouldn't have 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 a, have a mob in place. I've even seen, um, for example, the Irish Citizens Assembly, um, which was held up as being like a model. Really interestingly, it was actually facilitated by a judge. And so, um, you know, often people like me who are professional facilitators and make a big play of how important it is to have emotional intelligence facilitation and all the system change for this stuff. Actually, I've seen quite remarkable, like, kind of high quality results come. Um, which have been facilitated in really kind of boring ways, but because the representation has been kind of exemplary, changes everything. And, 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 and so in, by definition, if it isn't representative, it isn't a citizen's assembly. So, and, 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 it's, and basically, if it's not representative, it's actually pointless. Like, so that's the point of a citizen's assembly. Can I just ask you to clarify that specific process a bit more, Rich? How do oh, we know yeah. that we get a, a, a mini public per se? Yes, great question. So, so there are kind of two, there have been two eras of these, of these. Um, so when I started off my career <laughs> in like 2002 doing this kind of stuff, we were obsessed about statistical representation. So in those days, under the Blair government of the UK, people like me got lots of money, we were very lucky. So we could run these events, they were called citizens summits in those days, and very often we were obsessed about um, re representation. So when I would run, run something, say for Manchester, I'd want to get a thousand people in the room. So it's quite interesting. So, so we, we didn't pay people, and Natalie, now we pay people to come along. Natalie was talking about that before. It's absolutely right. I completely agree with everything she said, all of it. I think it was a really great point. Um, um, but so we, what we used to do in those days is we used to basically have big budgets and we basically got a thousand people in a big conference center and we ensured that it was really an exemplary rep representation of that place we were trying to do. Now, the methodologies have changed, right, largely driven by the Irish Citizens Assembly, which has become kind of the fashionable model. Um, and it's all about sortition. So for example, what we do then is we will select people through a lottery mechanism, could be through random phone call selection, can be going through the electoral register, but there are problems with the electoral register because obviously lots of people aren't on the electoral register. But anyway, we do our very, very best to select people at random, and then we stratify those random selections to ensure that they represent people in terms of income, political views, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it all comes down to budget because you can only go so, 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 so long. And so what we tend to do, because we have this focus now on ensuring people's wages are covered, because we ask them to meet for much longer, our budget now, so the budgets I put together, almost all of it is around supporting the citizens show up. The, but what's happened is that because of that, we have lost the, the, the definition quality, if you like, the resolution of our representation. So it depends on the budget you've got, you've, you've got a trade-off essentially between the resolution of your representation and the kind of like the um, and the extent to which you want to pay people. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to another question now. Why is a citizens assembly required at all to achieve electoral reform? We often hear we just need to get them to do it to, to implement it. Why are you suggesting that a citizens assembly path might be the better way to go? Elizabeth, I'll give you. First I'll two. say I I wouldn't make the case that it is. Uh, if you can make the change, if you have the support of an elected uh, parliament, you should just go, right? You should do it because it takes a long time to get to consensus. The risk is of a referendum. So when you're offered the choice of a referendum or a citizens assembly, you need some way to legitimize the change. And I just want to flag for people in the UK and, and also Canadians to remind us, we have one government right now with an existing promise that they would change the system of voting before their next provincial election. And that's Premier Legault in Quebec and Quebec Solidaire and the Greens in Quebec and the other parties in Quebec that were part of that commitment uh, uh, want to see it move ahead. Uh, so, but he's, well, of course, COVID's interrupted, but if the, if the Quebec uh, Assembly Nationale were to make the decision, okay, we're doing it, I wouldn't say, wait a minute, you can't do that. You haven't had a citizen's assembly. I'd say, yes, okay, because once we get one jurisdiction in Canada to make the change, everyone else will follow. Anyone else like to respond to that question? Kleiner? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think uh, with with the the oh, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought completely. You say the question again very quickly. Why is a citizens assembly required yeah. at all? Thank Why do we need to go that route? 
Thank you. I, I knew I was going to go wrong somewhere tonight. Um, so I think it's not necessary. I think it's the best way. As far as we're concerned, it's the best way. Um, what we don't think is that the politicians should get to choose the voting system they're elected on. Um, but if we saw uh, a situation, there are multiple ways we could get there. It could be through a constitutional uh, convention. It could be through a, a party or a, a alliance or coalition of parties agreeing that they're going to bring in PR because they were elected with a mandate to do so. Um, and, and we certainly wouldn't want to stand in the way if a whole load of parties were saying we're going to implement, implement this kind of PR. Um, we would be pushing very hard to make sure it was good enough and some forms of PR really aren't proportional enough and they're really not good enough. Um, like the system we used to use to uh, elect our representatives to the European Parliament in the UK. Um, but uh, I think ideally it would be through the, the deliberative uh, informed citizen led proce process. Thank you. And Natalie, you wanted to speak? I was just going to say, I mean, it is worth saying, of course, in the UK, we have uh, quite a bit of PR at levels below the UK level. Um, you know, the re relatively recently created Welsh Assembly, Scottish Parliament, London Assembly, um, and indeed Northern Ireland Assembly um, are some form of PR, fairly reasonable, not perfect, but reasonable. Um, and indeed, the Welsh Assembly has just created a system whereby lo Welsh local government can bring in PR in their local systems. So we have this operating in all of these modern new created systems. But as, as I kind of said in my introductory remarks, I think the key problem is that if we have an election, it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult to get all of the parties to sign up to a particular system of PR as kind of found in 2017, getting them all to sign up to the principle of PR or most of them to sign up to principle of PR is one thing. And you, just this is my learning from the, the AV referendum in 2011. As soon as you get bogged down into arguing detail, the public just goes, oh, it's all just too complicated and difficult. You know, PR is really, really simple. As a voter, you don't have to worry about the system. You just vote for what you want and you get it. And it's really crucial to get that across. And anything that makes it looks complicated is immediately putting you in a really difficult situation. And I see, you know, whether you call it a constitutional convention or a people's assembly or whatever, you know, saying, well, you know, we're going to push for PR. We're not going to inflict it on them. We're going to do this. And this will be the way we think we'll deliver PR. Just takes you away from that debate about systems, which, you know, I always fight debating systems. Can I just throw in quickly, Nat, to Natalie's point, when we did this, which Canadians will remember vividly, this process of the Electoral Reform Committee based on the promise that Justin Trudeau withdrew that 2015 would be the last election under first past the post. But in, in, in the context of that, we looked at polling, which was fascinating, that given, now, but this wasn't an open-ended question to Canadians in, in, a, in a statistically significant poll, uh, what, to name our system of voting, just to name it. And it wasn't an open-ended question. It had a list, right? So you could choose first past the post, preferential voting, proportional representation. Only 40% of Canadians could accurately pick the system we now use to be able to name it, much less explain it. So that's why we're wrong-footed. As soon as, because we're so keen as, mm -hmm. as people who want PR, we can dive into passionate debates that say STV is a terrible system. It must be MMP. Well, you lose everyone because the first thing you have to explain them is the system of voting we use, by the way, folks, is insane. Let's talk about it for a while. Let's talk about it for years. Let's just keep saying, uh, you know, I, 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 I won't go into it at, at great length, but you can find a YouTube I did for one of those crazy um, whatever it is, those talks that you do for a minute. But it's an insane system of voting that really looks like falling around in Queen Victoria's uh, hand-me-downs that no longer fit Canada at all. We should not talk about PR. We should only talk about the system of voting we have so people understand it. Good point. Thank you. Next question. When people are struggling to survive in this pandemic, just trying to get through the day, get through the week, how do we engage them on electoral reform? Don't all put your hands up at once. <laughs> okay, I see Natalie and then Kleina. Sorry, I'm trying not to jump in all the time, but uh, you know, I think, it, again, I come back to, if you look at the 2016 um, 
uh, referendum on Brexit in the UK, um, people were engaged with that slogan of take back control and an understanding that they were living in communities where, where they didn't have control over what happened in the community, where they were saw people, you know, their local hospital A&E closing down, they saw people working in, you know, zero hours jobs um, with low minimum wages. And you, the people who are running things now have been put there by our current system. You know, there's the, the in climate, there's you know system change, not climate change. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, ha I haven't got nice alliterative versions like that, but you know, system change, not poverty, system change, not zero hours contracts, system change, not privatization of our council housing. You know, put it whatever in you like, but say, you know, the current system has delivered what we have now, what we have now is broken let's try a different system let's go to a different system okay. so it all has to be linked to that physical reality of people's lives great thank you Kleina um go ahead and I'm just going to try and fit in a couple more questions if we can we've only got 10 minutes left so go ahead Kleina so I think this whole question about how um how do we start talking to people about democracy when they've got really urgent um, kind of crisis type things going on in their lives and I know like when we first went into lockdown in the UK both our campaign and a lot of other campaigns were being really kind of hesitant to start with it's like is this really bad taste to carry on campaigning but the reality is everything that happens in a country is to do with politics to do with democracy and if it's being done badly then that affects everybody and our response to COVID in the UK has been horrible it's been absolutely terrible there was a point back in um, April where there was a, it might have been in the Financial Times but there was some really kind of reputable article about how uh, proportional democracies were responding better to the pandemic I think that then changed like in terms of the stats because there's so many confounding factors but I mean if you just kind of pick a couple of examples if you if you look at New Zealand and their response to the pandemic and they have PR and they got rid of first past the post back in the 90s and if you look at the UK and our response to the pandemic it's, it's, it's just terrible and so it's I'm not saying that there is a kind of exact link there but what you can say is first past the post results in terrible governance um, and in all sorts of ways and we're actually going to be doing a series of events over this year called democracy loves dot 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 so democracy loves climate justice democracy loves equality democracy loves healthcare, and and there's evidence around each of these things like loads and loads of political science from around the world that there are strong correlations between them and we need to be making that case we need to be talking about the things that people care about so mm -hmm. like you care about the nhs let's talk about that and the link with democracy so so let's bring it home thank you okay another question in the uk it was the conservative party that called for the first uk citizens assembly on climate change in reaction to large scale protests and demands from groups like Extinction Rebellion. How could we most effectively call for a Canadian Citizens Assembly to address major issues such as climate change or proportional representation? I mean, and you'll know you'll know the um, you'll know the Canadian context better than me, but in my opinion, and many of my colleagues in the democracy space disagree with this, but I spent you know an awful lot of my life. Um, campaigning for things like citizens' assemblies on issues like climate, um, and in, in it, what and it is, in my opinion, those mass movements adopting it as a slogan that has made all the difference. That, that's my—I don't, I don't know what Natalie thinks and Cleaner, but that's definitely what I think. And so, and indeed, what I've been—I've been talking to quite a lot of groups, um, you know, over the last kind of six to twelve months about how we could create something which really builds takes that forward, takes some of that, that energy, because what's happened in Black Lives Matter and the climate movement is this in this activation around realising of this issue around democratic reform. And I think so. I think, I mean, we, we probably should talk to Cleaner and Natalie more about this kind of stuff. Um, and, and there's definitely a, there's definitely more awareness in, in, I would say, globally now around a democratic crisis than there's ever been in my lifetime. And so I think absolutely managing to take these kind of systemic fixes and but plugging them into these fundamental challenges that people are activated by is the way we change the system is, is the way we change the democratic system 
Thank I you. just like for Canada, I would not want us to see taking up a, a, a campaign to tell our government we want a citizens assembly on climate because they would use it as yet another method for further delay. They are great at making promises. And, you know, I mean, the, the, the fact that Justin Trudeau's first phone call to Joe Biden was to complain that he'd canceled the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, no doubt the liberals from Justin Trudeau on down are in a state of deep shock from the experience of seeing someone in politics keep a promise. It's not something which, with which they're familiar at all. So here's Joe Biden canceling Keystone, canceling fossil fuel subsidies. The liberals will do anything to delay action on climate and to spin out their fake leadership through the next election campaign. But I would love to see us as a, as a group of citizens say, we're starting our own citizens assembly on climate. We're gonna to have to do it on Zoom. We, we can't congregate, but let's do citizens hearings on where we are right now on climate, what we need to do for just transition. How do we protect the workers in the fossil fuel sector? What are, our, what are the steps our government should be taking? Th that would be very worthwhile, especially if it came from the Fridays for the Future youth groups and the, the Extinction Rebellions and the 350s, the groups that are on the ground on climate, as, as, and I don't want to sound too critical of the groups that are big and national, but the big and national organizations have become a bit captive of the Minister of Environment staff, uh, to be not to be too blunt about it, but we need real mobilization for climate action while there's still time, because Canada is the laggard of laggards in the industrialized world. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just, we're almost at time, we've got five minutes left here, and I think that there are so many questions that remain to be answered, but what I would like to do is offer each of the panelists just a final opportunity to make any comments about any of the things that have been raised today or an additional takeaway that you'd like to leave us with. So who'd like to go first? Uh, just Elizabeth. because... Just because I've been wanting to chime in on Natalie's point about whether we're a real democracy. Um, the late journalist James Travers made this point when Harper was in power, and I repeated it a lot in at the time, and I think it's still true. And what Travers said was, when you go to Ottawa, you don't really see a democracy. You, what, what you have there is a democracy theme park. You have all the buildings, you can tour parliament, you can see them. Now, I think that was a remarkably a uh, brilliant and insightful thing to say, because once I saw that, I thought, right, I'm a member of parliament and I'm in a democracy theme park. Uh, one MP, I mean, one MP can do a whole heck of a lot actually, but all the other parties control their MPs to make sure they don't do anything that's not coloring within the lines, right? So you, uh, I think real democracy comes from eliminating political parties. That would be the best way. Then you actually don't need to worry about fair voting because people vote for each individual MP and you never have to worry that there's a distortion between how people voted and what they get. It's only the presence of well-organized political parties to suppress democracy that makes the system so anti-democratic. Since we can't get rid of political parties necessarily, then we need, we need fair voting as soon as possible. But I think the more radicalized we are in our language around what does democracy really look like, the more that we will get people who are disillusioned and turned off the, the importance of their vote, get them back in to vote for what they want. Thank you. Natalie, go ahead. Well, I always like to finish on a message of hope. And I actually, probably somewhere around about 2013, I didn't keep track, but I started saying then that the future of politics doesn't look like the past. And I think if you look back through from British politics from 2013 to 2021, uh, you know, everything from the Brexit referendum to uh, three elections in five years uh, to I've lost track of how many prime ministers now, but we've been through quite a few. Um, you know, we're in a period of massive change. And the fact that the future doesn't look like the past is really, really good news. And I mean, that's also true on climate. It's also true on so many other things. Uh, but you know, often it feels like we've got this huge barrier in front of us. This has been the system you know, for a century or more. The last change in British politics, the last real change was women getting the vote, which was more than a century ago. Um, but 
you know, it's clearly broken now. People are very fed up and things are changing really fast. And that's great news and that's a great opportunity. So, you know, even if you're someone who's been working on these issues for decades and feel like, you know, I've been slogging away at this and we haven't seen any change, we're at the point where things are ready to break wide open and we have to make sure we're there in there with a message of hope and democracy. Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about politics being divided between two sides. The other side is the far right. It's Trump. It's Front National in France. It's people like you here for the Brexit Party. Um, and people say, you know, how do you know you're going to win if that's the choice between two politics? And I don't know that we're going to win, but I know that history is not pre-written. It's made by people taking action. So, you know, this is a great time to be taking action on democracy. Um, and that's my message of hope to finish with. Great. Thank you for that. Oh, building off Natalie and Elizabeth and I really agree with you both and I thought those quotes Elizabeth they're amazing I'm, I'm just like writing it down furiously um and so so apart from, I've never written a book around this stuff so and so I started like a lot of people this year I started writing a book called good good and bad democracy um, which but chiming very and um, um, it's basically a handbook for kind of campaigners working on this kind of stuff um anyway but I think one of the things that really hit me is that I think the way we think about democracy is a far too small a system. Of course, electoral reform is part of it. Of course, citizens assembly is a part of it. But public services are part of it too. I mean, if you look at how, say, self-efficacy or agency are generated, our schools or education systems, the way we talk to our neighbours. And I think, you know, during this year of kind of, of COVID and lockdown, many of us have realised that our actions matter, whether we social distance, whether we look after our neighbours next door, whether we decide whether we've, we've got, and we've got, we've kind of got these new techniques for kind of like helping, you know, our friends who are scared. We will all have friends who are very scared about the virus. Right? My neighbour is extraordinarily scared. You know, I live through that door over there. I've had to work with him and just build his confidence and build his self-efficacy and agency when, you know, when say, when say we've had guests around as we could last summer. And the reason I mention this is I feel like we're all getting these new skills that are about connection, that are about possibility. And we are definitely, we have definitely gone down that interregnum slope. We've definitely hit, you know, rock bottom at certain times. And I do feel those green shoots emerging. But I think we have to, when we think about the future of democracy and what it's about, we need to think what's it for. And for me, it's about two things. It's about safety. It's, you know, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, tackling climate, in terms of inequalities, in terms of human rights, and it's in terms of freedom. And it needs to be about both of those two things. And I think that if we really detach ourselves, and you know, I need to detach myself from citizens' assemblies, and I suggest you should detach yourselves from electoral reform just for a moment, just to help ourselves think really freely, okay, what could the future really look like? The more I think we detach ourselves from our ideas of what it's got to be like, the more likely we are to create something that will really work. Wow, thank you. Kleina, final word to you if you'd like it. Thank you. Um, so first of all, massive thanks to Anita and, and all of you at Fair Vote Canada for organising this and for all of the great work that you do. And if I may just encourage everyone in Canada to contribute to the campaign. Um, both campaigns are very much kind of grassroots, volunteer led. And so all, all donations will really help get us to where we're trying to go. Um, and uh, also, <laughs> Rich, I want to nab you to advise us when we actually <laughs> get to the point of doing our citizens assembly. Yes, yes, amazing. <laughs> get people on camera agreeing to these things. <laughs> um, and and you've given me another brilliant quote, Elizabeth. The democracy theme park. Um, I, I go to Parliament Square. Well, I don't these days, but back when I did, and I just think all these tourists taking photos like do you have any idea this isn't something like, okay maybe the building's worth taking a picture of but this isn't democracy <laughs> so, so let's go with the hope that we're all calling for and let's move from the democracy theme park and let's move to real democracy in all of its types and all of its glory and we can get there let's be open-minded about what it is and let's get there together Wow, thank you so much, all of you, for amazing presenters today. I feel like we've had a bit of a dream panel here for this, uh, a dream team for this panel today. So thank you very much, all four of you. Um, and yes, as we're wrapping up here, I'll just remind your, our participants that you'll be taken to a donation page as you leave this webinar. You'll be able to choose which organization you would like to donate to. But whether you're in a position to donate or not, we are incredibly grateful to all of you for being here and for 
for participating today. Your support enables us to continue to grow this movement, which will make the change that we need. So you will be receiving a link to the recording within a week or so on our YouTube channel. And please do share it within your own networks. That's another very tangible step that you can take to help us grow this movement. 